some of those initiatives and what did you learn from your failures? Well, um, and I can only speak to Tulsa. Uh, I found the Tulsa public school system to operate in a kingdom mentality. Uh, we, we control this kingdom and, and no one tells us what to do. Uh, I will tell you, uh, I, I started off by looking at the schools in my district and seeing what state programs were available for uh, teacher training and remediation and leadership. The district, um, I spent ample time meeting with everyone, every member of the administration at the central office and each one of my school board members, and I was uh, literally told this is not uh, your job to do uh, or to assist and help. And I, I tried to open up to my district all of the various programs that were available. We talked from pre-K. I told you about that, or, uh, the, the, this past superintendent who basically tried to rip this early childhood development center that's been lauded around the nation and studied by Georgetown University as a model. I've had to work independently to try to keep him off of that. He's gone now, so I guess I accomplished that goal. But the, <laughs> the other pieces and components have been in Oklahoma. We developed three or four programs to help teachers who are struggling to try to reach kids in math and science and history called uh, 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 PDIs or professional development institutes. Tried to bring those to my district, was told, no thank you. Uh, I, I looked at several options and outside options to bring in to provide some leadership and leadership training within the building, because we all know it, if we can get good leadership in the building, we can do phenomenal things, told to go away. Um, I, my, the, I guess the reason I've, I've probably been driven to, uh, to the end on this deal is because no one focuses on how do we figure out what's best for the kids in that area, and I don't want to say they don't care, but it becomes such of a system, a bureaucratic bureaucratic place that people sit in an administrative building and they don't get out. I wouldn't dare criticize this superintendent because I've heard great things about how he has moved out into the community, but he's tied up because he's got to have a board. If it's seven, he's got to count to four. And he's got to play an enormous amount of politics. We have got to be done with all of that because uh, in reality, we have all of the resources we need if we don't, if we but, but we continue to fight each other mm. and use each other as each other's enemy and treat education as zero-sum game that we never figure out how to use best practices and resources to achieve the overall goal. And so that is where we have to be as legislators, is, is urging our constituencies, be the be it the, the, the uh, associations that represent teachers or administrators or our community, how do we come together and form best practices and not be so much of if I gain, you lose, but we all gain if we have quality pieces of education that's, all throughout the right. work to achieve the overall goal. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Right. I'm, now, I'm going to ask, uh, y'all are very articulate, <laughs> but I'm going to ask that you uh, hold your responses to two minutes. I grew up in a Baptist church. Uh, you, sound like a, you sound like a preacher. But, <laughs> but, uh, but if you would hold it to two minutes, because the, there's parents out here, and I want to get to them because it's, it's their children that we're talking to. Right. And so if uh, we can go back to you and you have... One minute to ask your question, and you got two minutes to respond. Okay, uh, yeah, Dr. White, he just uh, spoke about some of the frustrations you may face. Um, so you've done some amazing things, but if you had a magic wand and could wave that, what are the things that you have not been able to change that you wish that you could change? And how can we help you at the State House, um, and how can parents help you do that? Reverend Shoemate said we have all the money we need. I disagree with that. Because if I had more funding, I would have my, first of all, I have an early childhood education program, and I would have uh, students uh, speaking at least one foreign language by the time they get to kindergarten. And by the time they get out of primary, they would have two foreign languages. Uh, I would also start them earlier in um, mathematics. 
because I would have enough money to give them a uh, small group training count similar to what Sylvan does on an individual basis. I would uh, be able to pay teachers like they're professionals, mm -hmm. and I would have a merit system of some kind that would allow teachers to earn the equivalent of what principals earn uh, more if they uh, had uh, certain initiatives and they were doing certain things with kids and parents, they would earn that, and that's not necessarily what their test scores are. That's how they're serving, supporting the, the children, the parents, et cetera. I would uh, pay uh, those people who are in charge of the schools like they should be paid as the executives they are. I would uh, make sure that all of my buildings and all of my facilities were first rate so that uh, children would know that we cared about them every time they walked in and looked around the place. I would uh, make sure that we engage parents if we had to send people to their homes five days a week uh, to make sure that they were connected some way with the schools. Uh, I would have a parent university that we would start when a parent has a child. Uh, in the hospital, they would be delivered a note that would say, uh, congratulations, you're now uh, uh, in the Indianapolis Public Schools. We will be coming to share information with you uh, very soon. We would have a program that would take them from birth right on up where we would train them, tell them how to prepare their children for learning, uh, give them this home library. Uh, I would make sure that my students were engaged in arts and music and athletics so I can get them to be holistically educated. I would make sure that my teachers were professionally trained on a continuing basis. I would give every child a computer. We would uh, incorporate books into a computer so they wouldn't have to need books. There would be in the computer. I would work with publishing companies that buy the rights to put everything on software my so that goodness. they wouldn't. <laughs> huh? My goodness, I, I, think, I think you have the I list. Could go yeah, on. yeah, you could go <laughs> on and on, and, 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 and we appreciate it. What you have said. Yeah, uh, uh, because uh, uh, he's an educator. About, if you're talking about vision and what Right, do, right. That is very good. We, we can go on. Very good. But uh, we have two minutes. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. This isn't working now. Okay. Um, that it, options weren't enough, but having said that options aren't enough, which types of options would you like to see more of in Indianapolis? Um, what kind of opportunities do students need in um, both the district and the charter systems? I think if related back to the last point that I made, we need more middle and high schools that serve kids really well. Um, I think we have some evidence that, um, and this is saying nothing about early childhood and its importance. And this isn't saying anything negative a, a, about the importance of, of early childhood and elementary education, but the high school dropout epidemic we have and the significant drop-off among middle school, student, middle school achievement that we have is a problem that our community has got to take extremely seriously. And we have an option where we can affect change in those systems right now. Not waiting for the years it's going to take, but doing it right now. Because these are real kids that are currently in middle and, middle and high schools, not all of them, but a number of them that are not working as well as they should. And we have to fix that now. Okay, uh, Mr. Clark, if you could talk a little bit about um, what's going on in other states that you think um, would be good role models, given the particular challenges our state faces, what are some of the things we can do from other places? Can't I do the, what have you failed at question? 19, I counted them this morning. In 1999, more than 20 education and business organizations got together to cooperate and were able to work with Republicans and Democrats in the legislator, legislature to raise academic standards and reform school accountability in the state. And two years later, that same bipartisanship passed the charter school law. And so if, um, if I were asked what I am failing at, I am failing to contribute to that bipartisan progress as we were able to do several years ago. And in the spirit of confessing my failure to further that bipartisanship, I'm hoping others will confess their failures too and we can get back to where we were five or six, seven years ago. Okay, thank you. 
And finally, yeah, um, just the last question I'd like to ask you. Um, you know, earlier Mr. Clark asserted that vouchers may not be the most effective way to um, really impact. If you're looking at total impact, um, what would be your arguments that that's the strategy you've chosen? Well, it's a strategy that actually parents have chosen, not that we've chosen, we've just supported it. I mean, there's research, and you can go to the Institute for Transformation of Learning and look at a piece that I published in 2005, which looked at studies from several cities which show that children in these programs have actually done well academically and have graduated. But if, in fact, vouchers are just too controversial an issue to deal with, you also have things like tax credits and tax deductions, uh, which can support the same thing in terms of giving parents an option in the private school sector if they like it. So if that's just too hard to pass, you've got other options there as well. Okay, we have a burning question from the audience. <laughs> um, I have a lot of burning questions. I've been holding my hand up a long time. Um, first of all, let me say I'm very happy to have you to come out into our community. And Tigger Bishop has always brought the people into the community so that we could hear. Um, <laughs> I went to a private school, but I didn't know it was a private school. It was called Crispus Attucks, where we had to go there. There was no other schools that we could go to, but it was a private school because it was just us. And with us, there were some strong, strong teachers that had master's degrees, doctor's degrees, because they had to compete against each other because they could not teach at no other school. We had a school where if you were black and you went to Short Ridge or Howe or Broad Ripple or Tech or Washington and you created a problem, you had to go to Christmas Attucks. There was no other school that you could go to in our school, we had students who prepared for college. We had students who prepared for just regular academia. We had students who prepared for vocational training. Now, I got a question and a statement. You want me to make it short? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but y'all went back. Okay, first of all, the superintendent needs more money. Since the state representatives are here and the state person, why don't we go back and get the money that the suburban schools took and kicked our kids out of school? That's one alternative. What can, excuse me? Yeah, I'm talking about desegregation okay. and busing plan. I just plan. wanted to be clear. Okay, yeah, I'm talking about desegregation and busing plan where kids were made to go to these suburban schools. They got money for coming okay. out there, and then they kicked the kids out. The kids didn't get the education, but they got the money. They developed vocational training schools. They upgraded everything with this same money. What's but, the next question? Oh, okay. Thank you for keeping